talk. Uh, the next speaker is Kaushal Srinath from UC Berkeley. Uh, to hear what he's been up to recently. Go for it, Kaushal. You're muted. Hey, thanks, Arun. Yep. Turns out finding the mute button is pretty hard on Zoom. <laughs> so I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me. This has been an amazing workshop, so very nice talks. So for today, I wanted to talk a little bit about a tangential research direction for my group on something that combines locomotion and manipulation. So how do you use legs to manipulate objects? And how do you the ma use the manipulated object to actually locomote? So this is not the primary research thrust, but uh, I think we have a few projects that I wanted to mention. We don't have a unified theory on locomotion and manipulation as yet. So it'd be great to have a discussion on this. So at some point, um, NSF had a workshop that combined, that was looking at how to combine locomotion and manipulation. Anyway, towards this, uh, I wanted to first start by acknowledging all the students who've done the work on these projects and the funding agencies. All the work that I present is because of the students. I just get the credit for this. Uh, so quick outline. So we'll start with uh, bipedal robots and we'll look at how we can achieve local manipulation with these. And then we'll jump into quadrupedal robots. So we'll start with first the problem of riding on hover shoes. So this is the problem I posed to the students. So we take this CASI robot that was designed by Agility Robotics and we pose the question of, can you ride on these hover shoes? And just in case you haven't seen hover shoes, or you haven't heard of hover shoes, this is what a hover shoe is. I don't know if the video is playing for you. Maybe not. There you go. There you go. So you can do some amazing cool things with this. So humans can do this. So how do you make robots do, do something similar? Now the question is, of course, why would you want to do this? Legs are great for locomoting on rough terrain. They're energy efficient, they're fast, but nothing comes close to wheels in terms of either speed or energy efficiency when you're locomoting on its flat ground. In fact, this is the reason that you would hop onto something with wheels if you want to jet across campus or jet across the town. So the research question here is how do you combine the two to achieve multimodal locomotion? Use legs when that's the most efficient mode of locomotion and then jump over to wheels and vice versa. Now this is a challenging problem. So you probably see you've seen uh, segways. If you go along this axis, there's a segway, there's a hover board, then the hover shoes. It's become increasingly hard to ride on. Now putting a robotic system on top of this with legs is even harder because CASI itself is a high dimensional system. These hover shoes are split into two, so you need to coordinate the motion of both of these to move forwards or to turn. And moreover, you don't have any information on these two systems separately. The only way they can interact is through force. So you have contact information. So you have two robotic systems that are interacting through force. And when you initialize the CASI on these hover shoes, since you have two different hover shoes, you, know, you have uh, manufacturing discrepancies between the two, so the dynamics could be slightly off and the way you place your feet also could be off. So the controls that you develop have to be robust to these. And you can also combine this with perception. So you can have additional challenges of estimation and obstacle avoidance. So if you look into the dynamics of the system, now Cassie is a 20 DOF system. It's got five actuators per leg, lots of under actuation. We can also look at the dynamical model of the hover shoe, which is more simpler. So here theta is the pitch angle of the hover shoe. So if you pitch, if theta is non-zero, the velocity, the speed increases. So the acceleration is dependent on theta. When theta becomes zero, acceleration becomes zero, but they could have a non-zero velocity, so you could keep moving. You could also apply a torque on this to change the yaw. So you can either, so just like a segue, you can go forwards, backwards, but uh, different from a segue, you can actually yaw around. Now it turns out these forces on the horseshoe can be mapped back into these inputs. And these inputs, these forces are what would be then indirectly applied by the CASI robot. So you can combine this with a balancing controller. So you can take an existing balancing controller that will not work on these hover shoes, but then you make modifications to enable it to ride hover shoes in the forwards, backwards directions, regulate velocity and turn. And you can combine it with velocity control. So here's the system in action. 
So you're using vision to not only find out your, to estimate your state, but also to localize and to find out obstacles. The controller is fairly robust. You can ride down stairs. You can do stairs of multiple heights, multi, multiple stairs. Since you have two different legs, you can ride on different heights. Now here, you can also go around obstacles. So it's a new way to navigate around obstacles. Now the feet are not stuck to the hover shoe, they're actually just placed. So your controller has to ensure that your force contacts, the friction cone is satisfied. So here's the autonomous system. So you just give it a goal location. It finds the obstacles, it localizes the system, goes around to the goal. Now this is all experiments indoors. You can also put, test this out outdoors on a sidewalk in Berkeley. Turns out the Berkeley sidewalks are pretty rough. So you run into all kinds of things. You can also do some off-roading with this controller. So here you'll see this going on the regular terrain. Okay, so let's look at another application where you try to ride on a system with wheels, but the wheels are not powered. They're not actuated, they're actually passive. This is an example of a snake board. So a snake board is like a skateboard, but it's got these additional degrees of freedom. So where if you actuate to two pads, then you get forward motion. And this happens because of non autonomic constraints at the wheel interface. And as you can see, you need to have a lot of yaw action on your system to move forward. So there's a lot of work done on non homonomic motion planning. And this goes back to the 90s from Jim Ostrowski and more recently by uh, Hobby Chosset and also by Shai Revzin. So the idea here is you can take your local variables. So these variables are your degrees of freedom for the two pads and the central degree of freedom. And by actuating this in a specific pattern, you can get motion along these global variables. So these are also what are known as shape variables. Now it turns out we cannot actuate these degrees of freedom directly, but you can actuate these indirectly by placing the robot's feet on it and applying a yaw, or by applying a yaw at the body, the pelvis. So you're indirectly actuating this, which in turn would actuate these local variables, which would then indirectly actuate these global variables. So if you look into some of this non autonomic motion planning literature, you'll find out you know periodic actuation of the shape variables would give you all kinds of different gates. So these are the drive gates to move forwards. You can move sideways. This is the parking gate. You can also rotate. So what we will do is instead of actuating this U1, U2, U3 directly, we'll indirectly actuate it through this contact forces Fi, which is then indirectly actuated by the joint torques on the robot. So in some sense, you're applying this joint torques and you're manipulating these degrees of freedom, which would then locomote you forward. So here's an example of the controller in action. You're given different velocity commands. So the red is your desired velocity and the black is the, your achieved velocity. So the controller is based on this non autonomic motion planning for the skateboard, which then uses an optimization based force controller for CASI to regulate the contact forces, which then input the joint torques, which then would go to a robotic system. So this is all in simulation. We have to do experiments. So you can do velocity control. You can also turn, you can navigate around obstacles. You can combine this with uh, things like control barrier functions and so on. So another example of uh, doing locomotion and manipulation together, but this time with passive wheels. All right, so let's also look at another example. Here we'll look at Cassie the juggles. And the question here is how do you use a legged robot to drive a ball to a desired apex height? There's a lot of work done on this. There's a work by Martin Bueller and Dan Kodicek, amazing work that uses uh, mirror laws, which we incorporate over here. But it's slightly different because you cannot actuate the paddle directly. You can only actuate the paddle indirectly through the joint torques. So this paddle will be fixed on top of Cassie and then you need to regulate the ball position to and drive it to a desired apex height. If you look at the dynamics of just the ball and a paddle, you can model the paddle as a rigid body on which you can apply these force and moment. And you can apply this force and moment to then indirectly actuate the ball and drive it to a desired apex height. So this is a work that's similar to what was done 
earlier on juggling laws. Now, if you put the paddle on Cassie, you can no longer actuate this force and moment on the paddle directly. You can only indirectly actuate it through the joint torques. So these joint torques would then actuate this paddle force, which would actuate this for the ball, and then you can regulate the ball position. So here the ball, so the whole experiment is set up in a motion capture environment. So we can sense the ball position. We know the paddle, paddle position through the forward kinematics on the, on the robot. And we use this juggling controller with some modifications and combine it with a balancing controller for Cassie. And you can achieve the task of dynamic balance plus juggling on this combined system. So what the mirror law here does is uh, it's, it's a form of virtual constraint. So depending on the ball position, the paddle position would change. So the higher the ball, the lower the paddle and so on. So here you're also regulating the ball position laterally. So forwards and backwards, left and right. And then you're making it contact to drive it to a desired apex height. So you can do this on a tennis racket sort of paddle, but you can also replace it by different paddles. So here's examples of bouncing on different materials where the coefficient of restitution would change. Here's some examples of uh, training wheels for the task of balancing. And once again here, the legs are not fixed to the ground. So you can actually see some of the legs come off So if you do something wrong. Okay, so let's look at quadrupedal local manipulation. And the problem that we'll pose here is the following. How do I take a quadrupedal robot, make it balance on this ball? And we've seen this in, in uh, circuses. We've seen animals do this pretty well. So here's a little puppy that does this pretty well. This problem is actually fairly complex. Firstly, it's pretty dynamic. That's why a highly unstable system. You're trying to unify manipulation and locomotion. The ball itself is compliant. So it, it, can, it could deform. And we not only want to balance on this ball, we actually want to locomote. So I want to give a desired trajectory for the ball. And I want to then manipulate the ball using the legs so that I can drive along this desired trajectory. Now towards this, we'll make some two simplifying assumptions. So number one, the ball surface is non-deformable and the ball states are known perfectly. So here's a control in action where we run the ball along your desired trajectory, circular trajectory. So we take an existing controller from Sangwe Kim's group and we make some modifications. So given the ball reference trajectory, we compute what would be the force and moment to be applied on the ball to drive it along the desired trajectory, which then gets converted into foot placements, which then can gets converted into joint torques using a whole body impulse controller. So we make some changes to this. So here we have to look at the model of the robot and the ball together. And the foot placement controllers through MPC also has to be changed slightly so you can drive the ball based on the forces that you want. Um, I guess I'm running short on time. So the ball here is about uh, one meter in radius. We can not only achieve one particular gate, you can do all kinds of quadrupedal gates like trotting, bounding, and pronking. You can control speed. You can drive it along the desired trajectory forwards, backwards, and circular trajectories, as well as in place turns. So we've been doing simple experiments towards this. The main drawback or challenge we have is how do you find out the state of the combined system together? So we're still solving this. So here's an example where we've inverted the problem and we're trying to manipulate the ball with the robot on the ground. Here's another problem where we are trying to manipulate a human through a quadrupedal robot. So the human is a blind folded person. And the idea is to replace a human guide dog for a human. Now training guide dogs is time and labor intensive. It takes a long time to train them. It costs a lot and the success rate is small. It's like 40% success rate. So if you have robotic systems that can help out, you can address this very well. So here's a system. So there's actually a camera that tracks the person. There's a sensor on this leash. The leash itself can go slack and taut. There's a LIDAR that maps out your environment. So you have planning that does localization. You have uh, tracking of the human. So you combine all of this together and you can navigate a person autonomously. The person itself is blindfolded and you can lead them 
And we hope this would have large uh, societal impact for the visually impaired. Here's an example of another person. And here the robot decides that it needs to make the cable taut to reposition itself to navigate tight environments. And once again, then apply a force on the human. So you're manipulating a human through locomotion on a quadruped. Uh, some recent press on this. Okay, one last project. So we're looking at the project uh, problem of uh, combining multiple robots to do manipulation. Uh, this is preliminary work. It's only simulation. It basically combines four quadrupeds, throws the problem at a learning network to see if this would work. And in simulation, obviously this works pretty well. Um, we don't know if this is gonna work in experiments. So okay, we are looking at it. So you can do strike motions, you can turn around, you can change the payload mass from two kilograms to 20 kilograms. You can navigate on challenging terrain and so on. So in summary, I've provided you a, a, hopefully a new direction for your research that combines locomotion for legged systems along with manipulation for both bipedal and quadrupedal. So thanks for listening to me. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kajra. Um, it, it's cool thinking outside of just walking as the only application, because I think there are lots of others, as you indicated. Um, so we have one question in the chat that I'll get to first, and it's what do you think is necessary to use passive roller skates on a bipedal robot? Is it, in fact, a more efficient way of using legged uh, robots or skates? So I think the question is, is what's the overarching benefit of doing passive of roller skates on bipedal robots? Yeah, so this comes down to wheel versus legged locomotion, what's more efficient? And it depends on your environment. So if your terrain is flat, there's nothing that can beat wheels in terms of energy efficiency or speed. So in that case, you probably, it's better for your legged robot to hop onto these skates and then locomote on flat ground. But if uh, terrain becomes rough, then legs are more energy efficient and they're more faster. Do you see uh, robots that use other mechanisms like skates and skateboards and scooters or actually have built in uh, hybrid type uh, platforms? So because, the, you know, dynamics, for example, they, they've kind of got two platforms right now, one wheeled, one not. But, do you see this as becoming something where you do hybrid designs or use existing infrastructure? Yeah, so there, there is a lot of research in the hybrid design where you combine legs and wheels. In fact, Marco has presented his work. Boston Dynamics has this new robot called Handle. Uh, but if you put in wheels into your design, then you're unnecessarily having these wheels. You have to carry, on, carry around this extra mass of the wheel as well as the actuator. It's better to have these wheels lying around in your environment onto which you can jump on if required. So you have uh, scooters that you can rent out as humans. In the future, I envision legged like robots probably doing the same thing. Great. Um, another question, do you think uh, that with multi-robot manipulation, the robots may communicate implicitly through uh, using your know, feedback through the object rather than explicitly by synchronization of actions? So feedback uh, communication versus synchronicity. So uh, right now, the only interaction between these two different robotic systems is through contact. It's through a force, uh, through an interaction force that's applied between the two. In the future, you can probably synchronize through some communication between the two, in which case you could probably do a lot better. Great. Um, so we'll leave it there for the sake of time. Uh, so we have one more presentation.